If you're dealing with iron deficiency or struggling to raise your iron levels, did you know that your body has a secret iron bodyguard and that all of those old high dose iron supplements that you're taking actually cause that bodyguard to block iron absorption? So what is this secret bodyguard? It's called hepcidin. And it plays a super important role in regulating whether or not you can absorb the iron in your diet or from supplements. Yet most doctors prescribe iron doses like they've never heard of it. So today I'm gonna pull back the curtain and shed some light on this newly discovered piece of the iron absorption puzzle. We'll talk about why hepcidin is important, what triggers the body to release hepcidin, and how the old guidelines for iron supplementation actually work against you by activating your body's hepcidin response. But don't worry, stick around to the end of the video and we'll talk about what you can do to reduce hepcidin production and try to allow for iron absorption. In fact, after watching this video, you may likely know more than most doctors about hepcidin's role in iron absorption. So if this is something that you're ready to hear more about, just go ahead and hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. So what is hepcidin? Hepcidin is a polypeptide or amino acid hormone created in the liver that has been identified as one of the most important factors that regulates iron absorption. Now, hepcidin was discovered <laughs> actually by accident by a group of researchers around the year 2000, which means that in the world of science and medicine, this is still a very new discovery, but it has transformed our understanding of iron absorption. So you can think of hepcidin kind of like your body's full-time iron bodyguard. It's designed to protect you, and it allows iron in when you need it, and blocks iron absorption when you don't. But why would your body want to block iron absorption? We're trying so hard to get iron to be absorbed, right? Well, while iron is, is an essential mineral and we have to have it for our bodies to function effectively, iron is actually toxic if we have too much or if it's left just free floating in the blood. So our bodies have brilliantly designed safety systems in place to protect us from too much iron. So hepcidin acts like the bodyguard at the door of the cell, deciding when and how much iron is allowed to enter the bloodstream. Then, because iron is dangerous if it's allowed to run free in our bodies, we use iron chaperones like hemoglobin, ferritin, transferrin, and ferroportin to safely transport and store iron through the body. So how does hepcidin work? When hepcidin is released, its job is to seek out iron trying to enter your system and block it from being absorbed. So it does this by binding itself to ferroportin, which is the iron chaperone that is responsible for guiding iron absorption through the intestinal cells. So when hepcidin has wrapped itself around ferroportin, it blocks iron absorption because without ferroportin there to open the door, iron has no way to make it past the intestines and into the bloodstream. So what causes your body to activate this hepcidin response? There are three things primarily that will cause your body to release hepcidin. They are inflammation, adequate iron levels, and iron supplementation. So first, we'll talk about adequate iron levels. Your body works so hard to keep iron at healthy levels. And in an ideal situation, when your body has, ha has enough iron in circulation and in storage, it'll, sig it'll send the signal to release hepcidin. And it's kind of like saying, hey, we're good. The party's full, go ahead and shut the door. We don't need any more iron. So hepcidin heads out to the door and stops ferroportin from allowing in any more iron. Because remember, too much iron isn't a good thing. But on the other hand, 
when iron levels are low, as in anemia or iron deficiency, the body is actively looking for and needing iron. So it tries to keep hepcidin levels low to allow more iron to pass through the intestinal wall and into the bloodstream. So the second reason that your body will release hepcidin is when it detects inflammation. So your body's goal is to protect you and keep you healthy. And it knows that just like we need iron to survive, infections and pathogens that make us sick also require iron for their survival and growth. So when your body senses inflammation, it decides that the best way to protect you is to block additional iron from being absorbed by releasing iron to go and guard the door. And then it locks away circulating iron safely into storage so that it's not available to be used by whatever threat or invading pathogen is causing that inflammatory response. The challenge is with chronic inflammatory conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, celiac, Crohn's, and rheumatoid arthritis, the inflammation caused by these conditions keeps hepcidin levels elevated and blocks iron absorption, which very often then leads to low iron and iron deficiency over time. So that brings us to the next big thing we need to talk about, the relationship between hepcidin and iron supplementation. Once you've been diagnosed with low iron levels, the next logical step is to start taking iron supplements to try and restore your, your iron to healthy levels. Yet, with what we now know about hepcidin's role in iron absorption, it becomes glaringly obvious that traditional guidelines for treating iron deficiency are kind of like trying to pick a delicate lock with a sledgehammer. What do I mean by that? In an attempt to get iron quickly into their patients, many doctors prescribe high dose iron supplements and often recommend taking those doses throughout the day to try and minimize the gastrointestinal side effects. The problem is traditional non-heme supplements have a very low absorption rate. So all of that unabsorbed iron is left bumping around in your gut like an angry party guest causing all of the side effects that you feel like cramps, nausea, and constipation. But more importantly, they are causing oxidation and inflammation in the intestines. And that inflammation caused by every dose of those non-heme supplements makes your body go into protection mode and triggers hepcidin production. And hepcidin production blocks iron absorption, which obviously just turns into a vicious cycle. The more iron you take, the more inflammation it causes, and the more you block your ability to absorb iron. Now I'll go, I go into more detail about the different kinds of iron supplements and how to improve iron absorption from both diet and supplements in the iron repair manual. So if you would like a copy of that, just click the link in the description and I will send you a copy. Okay. So studies have shown that supplemental doses of iron over 60 milligrams per serving trigger hepcidin production and that each subsequent dose further increases hepcidin levels. Then, once iron supplementation triggers that hepcidin, it takes approximately 48 hours for hepcidin levels to return back to baseline level. Which means that if you take a large dose of hepcidin, or a large dose of iron three times per day, you have likely increased your hepcidin levels each time, and thereby significantly decreased your ability to absorb the iron so basically, you wind up enduring all of the miserable side effects, not be able to absorb the iron, and then continually struggle with low iron levels. And in my opinion, that is a ridiculous system. Now, I was chronically anemic for years, and I did my best just to survive. But there was an elective surgery that I wanted to have, and my surgeon required my hemoglobin to be at an optimal level or she wouldn't perform the surgery. So I set out with renewed motivation to raise my hemoglobin level 
And I started taking iron in various forms and consistencies five and six times a day, thinking that my aggressive approach would get my iron up faster. But now, for multiple reasons, I know that was a horrible idea. In my attempt to take more iron, I was actually causing my body to release hepcidin with every dose and block the iron that I was taking, which is why it was so darn hard to get my iron level up. Now, hepcidin is such an important piece of the iron absorption puzzle, and you can see why understanding how it works is vital to effectively using iron supplements and why taking high-dose iron is often so frustratingly ineffective at improving your iron levels. So, after all of that, the last question that we need to ask is, if increased hepcidin blocks iron absorption, is there anything that we can do to decrease hepcidin production? And fortunately, there are a few factors that can help keep hepcidin levels lower to encourage iron absorption. So I'll share the things that I do. The first is to reduce inflammation. Now, I realize that this is certainly easier said than done for those struggling with chronic inflammatory conditions, but there are a couple things that you can proactively do to minimize inflammation. Now, these are for both those with chronic inflammation or anyone looking to improve their ability to absorb iron. One is take a collagen supplement. There is a ton of science behind the benefits of taking collagen, but as it relates to iron absorption, collagen peptides have a powerful amino acid profile that work to heal the lining of the intestinal wall, which is what we often hear referred to as leaky gut, and collagen helps improve nutrient absorption and reduce inflammation. Then it's also important to choose an iron supplement that has better bioavailability and is easier on the gut so that it doesn't cause that intestinal inflammation and oxidation that will trigger the release of hepcidin. Now, the second factor in decreasing hepcidin production is timing. Now, without the supplement-induced inflammation, studies show us that hepcidin is naturally lowest earlier in the day and then peaks in the evening to fall and then repeat the cycle again the next day. So taking your bioavailable iron supplement earlier in the day can harness hepcidin's natural rhythm. Now, the third factor is dosage. As I mentioned before, studies indicate that iron supplements over 60 milligrams per serving not only cause greater side effects, but they trigger hepcidin production as well. So choosing an iron supplement in a hepcidin-friendly dose is important. But here's a side note. If you have to take the high-dose non-heme supplements, there's a study that suggests that taking a single large dose every other day will allow time for the rise and fall of inflammation and hepcidin production that they cause before you take the next dose. So it would be every other day. The feedback that I've seen about this um, and the effectiveness of it is, is mixed, but it may be definitely worth talking to your doctor about if you have to take those higher doses. Now, the final factor that has been shown to reduce hepcidin levels is optimal vitamin D. Now, we've we've known for a long time that optimal vitamin D levels reduce inflammation, but now scientists are finding that there is a strong link between vitamin D and hepcidin. Now, vitamin D is an extremely common nutrient deficiency, and it often accompanies iron deficiency. And studies have revealed that daily vitamin D supplementation reduces circulating hepcidin levels by 34% for 24 hours, which is significant. Now, I will add a list of other videos that might be helpful if you're dealing with iron deficiency and a list of the supplements that I take in the description if you want to check that out after this video. Um, And then if you have any questions about this or suggestions for future videos, I'd love to hear from you. So just leave me a message down in the comments. Um, Thank you for watching the video. And remember, this is so important, 
I know that you, with the right knowledge and tools, you can fight your iron deficiency and take back your life. You're an iron warrior now. Thanks for watching.